I took the task of tutorial seriously. So, um, so uh, also considering that this room was pretty heterogeneous. So hopefully this will be interesting to everyone in the room. There may be parts of it that you know some of you know better than others. So uh, also just would like to recognize my student Kieran Evans, who's now a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, um, has done a lot of work with me in this area. And in fact, I'm going to point to it kind of halfway through, but um, I will be giving a research talk in three weeks' time here, uh, which is joint work with Kieran. OK, so, um, so this talk is about um, uh, differential expression in the two, two condition, two experiment, uh, experimental condition case, um, looking for genes that are differentially expressed. So kind of as, as straightforward a problem as you can get, um, but certainly probably the mu most ubiquitous um, problem that we're, we're analyzing data on a regular basis with. So, um, so this is what, what we're talking about here. We're really interested in the mRNA, the, uh, mRNA expression, or maybe just the RNA expression, sort of depending on what you're measuring, of, um, of these two conditions. And uh, <clears throat> I'm guessing that most of you are very familiar with this, this process here, um, that, we, that we take our RNA, um, we get the cDNA from that, we, um, we sequence these smaller reads, and then at the end of the day, we align the reads to an existing genome, and we uh, count the number of reads. So for those of you who don't do statistics every single day like I do, um, it's really important for us to keep in our heads that what we are most interested in is what's going on at the top, but the information we have is what's going on at the bottom, right? So I always tell my students, um, uh, you know, nobody cares about the data, right? Those people are dead. What we care about is me. I care about, you know, what these results say about me getting the disease or me, um, you know, ha having a particular treatment and whatnot. So we're really interested in these population level information, but what we have is sample level information, okay? And so somehow we need to compare these sets of reads. All right, and the problem at hand is differential expression. So a gene is differentially expressed across these two conditions. Um, if there's a difference in the amount of mRNA, we're just going to stick with mRNA for this talk, um, per cell produced under the different conditions. Pretty straightforward there. So how are we going to do this? First, we need to measure the gene expression, and that was that slide I, I showed previously. Uh, so we're really interested in these, these read counts. And then there's this super, super important factor that I'm going to talk about for a big chunk of this talk, which is normalizing this gene expression. And then, of course, we do the analysis piece, which is the differential expression analysis, just um, lots of different forms of hypothesis testing, depending on how, what, what differential expression method you're using. So this is a quote that I think is really important for us to think about, um, and, and, you know, I think it's actually pretty relevant for everything we're doing here because um, measuring things that we like to measure in this room is pretty different from measuring height. You know, you guys want to go find out how tall this person is over here? We can all measure that person and we'll all get pretty close to the same answer, right? But the types of measurements and the types of biological information that we're dealing with is not easy to measure. So, um, so this is a paper that compared, the, the gist of the paper was comparing differential expression methods. And what they found was, you know, the differential expression methods aren't really that different, but what matters is how you normalize the data. So, um, so that's important. Okay, so thinking about variability, um, you know, again, this idea that we can all measure the, this person's height and get the same answer, but we can't measure RNA and get all the same answers. Um, what types of ways do things vary? So, um, so the library size is the total number of mapped reads in a sample, all right? So, um, so for a given gene, the number of reads mapped to that gene can vary for lots of reasons. So one of the reasons it varies is how long it's spent sequencing, how long that sample is in the sequencer. 
There's other things like the ambient temperature. You know, there's all sorts of other kind of technical variability pieces that would make that measurement different, right? And certainly we don't want to say, you know, this sample, this normal sample has higher expression than this tumor sample simply because we left it in the machine longer, right? That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the second bullet point. We're interested in biological variability. We want to know, okay, well, the mRNA expression is higher in that one sample. That's the piece we're trying to get at. There are lots of other factors. For example, the length of the gene or the GC content. Some of you may be familiar with some of those things. We're not going to deal with that third bullet point today because our task is differential expression. So when I'm talking about differential expression, I'm comparing gene I in sample A to gene I in sample B. They, gene I has a particular length. So if I'm comparing it across these two samples, I'm not interested in the gene length or the GC content, though depending on other analyses for for example, um, principal components or some kind of clustering, those types of things might, um, might matter more. Okay. So this is what we get out of our sequencer. Um, you know, let's say we have uh, three samples under condition A, three samples under condition B, lots of genes, um, some highly expressed genes, some low expressed genes. I made that sample four just match up with my little picture there. I made the picture and then I made this the table and then I realized that they didn't match so I, then I made these numbers match so that they were 12 and then it seemed silly but you know lots of silly things happen with these types of measurements as some of you know. Okay so anyway we have this idea we have these integers right these reads that come out of those machines how many of those little cDNA fragments map to that genome to that uh, piece that gene on the genome rather. Okay, and again, we, we have this idea that we want to compare the data on the bottom in an apples to apples way. We want to know, did, is the expression in condition A higher than the expression in condition B due to the biological differences, not to the technical variability pieces? Okay, so as I've said, um, there are lots of different ways that, that, um, that the reads, that you get a lot of reads. And one of those ways is by leaving it in the sequencer. So you might think to yourself, well, just take the total number of reads and divide by that number. All right, so then we're sort of scaling. This is called total count normalization. Um, we're sort of scaling. We said, okay, how long was it in the sequencer? You know, that sort of makes sense. Well, let's see what happens when I do that. A, which is the top left picture there, if you can't see that A, is the truth. That's what's happening with the mRNA per cell. So that's just a little bar graph of the total mRNA per cell. And you can see that in condition A and condition B that the green and the turquoise are not differentially expressed. Okay, so the green and the turquoise are not differentially expressed genes, but the purple gene is differentially expressed. Okay, the purple gene is twice as big in condition B as it is in condition A. In, uh, in the slide B there, we see that therefore, in condition A, the purple, blue, and green each share a third of the mRNA. In condition B, the purple is one half, and the blue and the green are each one quarter. So we get these reads aligned to these genes, and what happens when we do the total count normalization is, is similar to not normalizing at all. What we see is that the, um, the normalized read count becomes a third for condition A and a quarter for condition B on the blue and the green and then a half for the purple. So what we're thinking happening, what we're thinking is happening when we normalize with total count normalization is that the blue and the green are overexpressed and the purple is underexpressed in condition B. Can you guys see that picture happening there? So 
what we'd like to do is somehow understand that the blue and the green are, dif are uh, not differentially expressed, and we'd like to use that information to scale these and, and have those library sizes be an apples to apples comparison that will allow us to then look at the rest of the genes to find out the degree of differential expression. I was gonna say one more thing about this picture. Oh, um, RPKM is very similar. RPKM is reads per kilobase per million. Um, so that takes into account the gene length, okay? So RPKM is very similar to total count normalization, but it also uses gene length. Again, we're not particularly con um, concerned with that right now because um, we're doing a gene by gene comparison. Okay, so a, a point worth making here is that in order for this total count normalization to work, we would need a, um, a, a down-regulated gene in condition A that was sort of perfectly symmetric to what was going on with the upregulation in condition A, or condition B, sorry. I don't know if I said that right. But, but it just seems um, a little bit forced to think about that perfect experiment such that this would work. And for those of you familiar with the literature, um, total count normalization uh, is sort of one of the least used methods, or I don't know least used, but least um, well-received methods because of, because of this problem. You don't tend to have perfect symmetry in how the experiments um, come out. Okay, so again, back to this big idea. We are going to, um, we really want to uh, um, compare condition A with condition, condition D on a biological front and not let these library sizes um, play a role. So if the gene is not differentially expressed, it shouldn't vary as a function of library size or biological condition. That's not to say it won't vary, because things vary. Right? There's lots of other things that make, that make these samples vary. Right? They're different samples, so they have different aspects to them. But they shouldn't be varying as a function of biological condition if they're not differentially expressed, and they shouldn't be varying as a function of library size. Okay, so, um, so here's another method for normalizing. This is median normalization. And, um, and what we're gonna do here is we're going to divide by the median gene size, uh, the median uh, count, rather. So, I don't know why I said gene size, the median count. So in this case, um, the median count, um, it's kind of trivial because they're all sort of the same, <clears throat> but it wouldn't be the purple gene. So we're gonna just sort of divide by uh, divide by the, the let's say, the, the turquoise gene, and um, we're gonna divide by the height of the turquoise gene so that we get that guy to be one, and so if the turquoise gene is one in condition B and the turquoise gene is one in condition A, we've got an apples to apples comparison, and, um, and we've got sort of that correct normalization. Um, median count is, um, median normalization is used um, um, throughout, it's, it's, there's also a lot of similar uh, normalization techniques. For example, um, sometimes uh, we use the 75th percentile instead of the median because <clears throat> um, sometimes you have samples that have a lot of zeros in them. So you don't want to ever divide by zero. You need like a special suit if you're going to do that. Okay. Okay, so then I'm gonna talk about one more technique here um, for normalizing DE-seq. So DE-seq is, is sort of widely thought of to be probably the best normalization technique um, and uh, uses some of the ideas of the median, um, the median normalization. So, so in a perfect world, what we'd like to do is we'd like to estimate the size factor, sort of, you know, the, the, the expression level, right, of the genes that are not differentially expressed. Okay, so, so notice here that this is not DE-seq yet, um, and what we're doing is we're taking the median over a set of genes that are not differentially expressed, and, um, and we're also dividing by 
the geometric mean across all of the samples. All right, so that division of geometric mean allows, um, allows the method to be a little bit less variable. Okay, so sometimes you get these really high you know, expression levels and whatnot, and, and so this kind of makes things a little more consistent. Um, okay, so let's think about that in this, in this scenario here. So if we knew which genes weren't differentially expressed, um, we could just find the median of those genes and um, let's see, okay, the green one and the purple one are not differentially expressed. The turquoise one is differentially expressed. So let's find the median of, of the green and the, and the purple. So I do that down here. Um, and, and if we look um, either at the numbers or at the bars, you can see that I've set this up quite nicely to be that the, that the green and the purple are not differentially expressed, but that in condition A, we've got this exactly this two-fold size factor issue. Okay, so, so right, the condition A sort of has twice, as amount, twice the amount of expression. That's how much longer, let's say, it was left in the sequencer as condition B. The green bar is twice as big in condition A. The purple bar is twice as big in condition A. So what do we get? We get that the size factor for, for sample one, I should have had an A there. I'm sorry about that. So that should be SA and SB here for those size factors. And, and the um, ratio of those size factors is two, which again is, that's what we want. So that, that works out well, as long as I did the math right there. Okay, quick, don't look. Okay, um, so, so the thing is though that in many situations, the median of the non-differentially expressed read counts actually equals the median of all the read counts. So that's why, why DE-seq works so well in normalizing these things is because, um, because we can then just find the, the sort of um, counts which have been standardized using the geometric mean and, um, and use that as a, as a size factor. Um, there's a reasonable amount of literature that says that um, global differential expression is a thing, right? So, um, so there's a paper in, in Cell um, 2012 that says that um, it, it, it describes an experiment where the transcription factor CMYK accumulates in the promoter region um, and causes transcriptional amplification. So, right, so if you're having some, something about your experiment, um, then you're gonna get global gene expression and then your median, uh, sorry, global, um, um, amplification in one condition, then your median is not going to be, the median of the non-differentially expressed genes is not going to be the same as the median of all the genes. So, uh, so that's this situation, right? So again, the panel A there is not the, um, not the reads, but rather the mRNA per cell, and we're seeing that in condition B, we have this global upregulation, regulation right, So this condition is a lot harder. Um, we can't use medians. If we use total normalization, we get simply um, that everything in A equals everything in B, and that's not what we want. Um, and, and the truth is, again, that uh, B is twice as, twice as expressed. And that's where um, control genes come in. Right? So if you've got a situation where you have really asymmetric differential expression or you have, um, or you have uh, um, complete uh, differential expression in one condition, then you're really going to need to think about control genes. So control genes could be things like, um, like housekeeping genes that you sort of know are, are not differentially expressed. Um, um, but, but you really have to make sure that they're not going to be subject to your experimental conditions. Um, or they could be things like spikins. Then you have to make sure that the spikins are behaving biologically in the same way that other things are behaving and whatnot. But when we can normalize using these control genes, we, uh, we can get the right answer. Um, okay, so I've, I've made these bullet points here. Um, uh, I've grouped them sort of along 
the same, they're, they're sort of similar, similar methods here. Um, and I've described the first three. TMM uses a, a, an iterative scheme where they're doing um, trimmed means, which are uh, along the same lines as medians, or they're maybe a cross between averages and medians. Um, Poisson Seek and DEGES uh, both use a method of um, finding the differential expressed genes and then using the non ones to do some normalization, then finding differentially expressed genes, then using the non ones to do some normalization, sort of an iterative back and forth um, uh, to get that normalization before they make the final call on which genes they think are. Um, are differentially expressed. And again, this is the talk I'm going to be giving in a few weeks um, that's going to get into a lot, of these, a lot of these methods in more detail and the assumptions behind them and the, um, the, uh, the outcomes, what happens when, when some of the assumptions are violated. OK, so now let's talk about differential expression. I already showed you this slide. Differentially expressed gene across conditions A and B if there's a difference in the amount of mRNA per cell produced under the conditions. So again, we want to know what's going on in the population. We can only measure differential expression in a sample. Okay, so this is because this room is heterogene hetero heterogeneous. That's the word, heterogeneous. OK, so uh, this is just a little crash course on hypothesis testing for those of you who didn't, um, don't remember your STAT 101 class. So how do, we, how do we do statistics? How do we make claims about differential expression? Well, we do it in the exact same way that we try to figure out whether a coin is fair or a coin is biased. So these are the steps. The first thing we do is we assume something boring. We assume something that we don't want. So in the differential expression case, we're going to assume that for gene number one, it's not differentially expressed. That's the assumption. So in this little example here, I'm assuming that the coin is fair. I'm assuming that, um, that it has a 50% chance of heads and a 50% chance of tails. The second thing I need to do is find a probability model. Well, in this coin case, the model is going to be a binomial. That's not going to be the case for differential expression, but a binomial model just simply says, uh, you know, I'm going to flip a coin 20 times, and every single time I flip it, it has an independent um, uh, probability of being heads of 0.5. Then I have to ask how likely it is to get this data if the null statement is true. So I flipped that coin 20 times, and I saw 19 heads and one tail. The probability of seeing 19 heads or one tail is 0.00002. And that says to me, OK, that's so unusual, that's so weird that I actually don't believe my first claim. That's how statistics works. OK, so I reject the null hypothesis if my data could not have been generated under that probability model. OK, if the data are reasonably likely, we don't really know. OK, so now I'm going to talk about differential expression in four different ways. Um, I'm going to talk about DEseq a little bit. In, in detail, that's this discrete probability calculations to get p-values, um, and then generalized linear models, a non-parametric test, and some Bayesian, uh, Bayesian ways of doing differential expression. So the probability model that a lot of these methods use is the negative binomial probability model. And again, all of those methods are using this probability model to find p-values. Okay, the p-value is the probability of seeing the data that you saw if your null statement, your boring, non-differentially expressed statement is true. Okay, so I've, I've written it out in sort of the DEseq um, notation, though again, a lot of these methods use negative binomial. So what the, what the DEseq notation here says is that my counts Right, the number, of, um, the number of reads that I get aligned to that gene will be a negative binomial random variable. That means it's an integer. And the average number of reads I get, mu ij, will be the number of reads expected for gene i under condition, that's rho of j, that means like, um, it's just going to be either condition A or condition B, whatever the jth sample is in, right? So 
when J is 1, 2, and 3, that's condition A, and when J is 4, 5, and 6, that's condition B. So it's that Q value, that's my expression strength parameter, times my sequencing depth, right? Because we divided by the sequencing depth to get this apples to apples comparison. So if we want to know how many reads should I get for that particular gene in that particular sample, well, it just, all that matters is, you know, which gene is it, which condition is it, and what is the sequencing depth. So that's how we get that mu value there. But really, it's Q that I'm interested in. I want to know if the expression strength, if the sort of the average expression, independent of size factor, is the same across condition A and condition B. And that's going to be my null hypothesis. I'm going to say, OK, my expression strength is, um, is the same for that particular gene. It's the same in condition A as it is in condition B. You know, set it under some null expression strength. And then I have a probability model, and I can, I can estimate all these things uh, in lots of ways. In fact, we talked about estimating SJ already. That's the DEC way of estimating SJ. OK, so, um, so I put this up here because I, I actually think it's really cool, but um, it's not necessarily something that you need to understand or, or remember. Um, so, so what do I do for, for this differential expression? It's easy now that I have this negative binomial to estimate any discrete probabilities. Um, so let me go forward and then I'll come back here. So let's say that in condition A, I had 10 reads, and in condition B, I had 90 reads. So I'm going to say, OK, that means there were 100 total reads that got mapped to gene I across all of the conditions and all of the samples. So what's the probability? that only 10 of those reads would go to condition A, and that 90 of them would go to condition B, right? Because we don't expect out of those 100 reads to get exactly 50-50. We understand there's variability in life. So if we got 49-51, we would probably say, OK, well, that's, you know, OK. But 10 and 90, how, how unusual is that? So this probability calculation is a, is a direct p-value calculation. It's the probability of your data, so the 1090, or more extreme. So we're adding up all the possible probabilities of x and y such that x plus y equals 100. All of those that are more unusual, so less likely, less likely, than getting 10 and 90. So presumably over here, one of them is 1 and 99, right? 1 and 99 feels less likely. But of course, there's also that size factor calculation that goes into it, right? So it's, it's a little more complicated than just splitting it up along a binary and, and understanding that. So this is my p-value calculation. The probability of my data or more extreme, so 10 and 90 or less likely, given the null hypothesis is true, which means given that I'm using these calculations. I'm using the negative binomial calculations, assuming that my, um, my size factors are the same. So I think this is pretty cool. OK. So um, another way to do it is through, well, OK, sorry, let me stay here for one second. So one problem with um, the, the DE-seq model, which was 2010, I think, two, 2010, so quite a while ago, is that it was really based on that, this two-condition example that I'm talking about today. It's really hard to generalize this idea of these p-values to three conditions or having a, having a response variable that's survival or, or you know, some kind of phenotypic characteristic, blood pressure. You know, how does a gene compare, how does a gene change with blood pressure, something like that. So this is much harder to, um, to generalize. So instead what we do is we use these linear models. So I'm going to talk about a linear model in this um, two sample case, but linear models, as many of you know, are extremely powerful in terms of generalizing to all sorts of different experimental conditions. So what does this look like? Um, a, just a, straight, sorry, a straightforward linear model says that the expected value of the normalized expression equals this linear thing. What does this linear thing say? It says, OK, for that gene i, I have a beta naught parameter, which is, um, which is the average expression for condition b. 
and I have a beta 1 parameter, which is the additional expression. And it could be additional in a negative sense, right? Beta 1 could be a negative value. But all it's saying is that the average expression for condition A is different from the average expression for condition B if beta 1 is non-zero. So my null hypothesis here is that beta 1 equals 0. That's what I'm going to be testing. I'm going to use this linear model. Um, and this particular linear model that I have here is the one that probably many of you saw in statistics classes, simple linear regression, where, we've, where we're assuming that the variability is normal. Now, of course, we've got these read counts, and they don't feel very normal to us. So we extend this linear model, and this extension has, you know, is, is super old. Lots of people do generalized linear models in lots and lots of different settings, where instead of just having um, the expected value be a, a, a simple linear function of that beta naught beta 1 combination, it's a, now a, you know, a flexible function of that beta naught beta 1. So g is what we call the link function. We now no longer expect normal normal errors, so we don't expect that Gaussian shape of the errors, and indeed we can use the negative binomial probability model easily in this context, and the, um, the inference is exactly the same. We're wondering, is beta, one zero, is beta 1 equal to 0? Because if beta 1 is equal to 0, then the average is just g of beta naught, okay, regardless of what the error structure is. So the inference is exactly the same. So there's quite a few functions, quite a few differential expression models that use these generalized linear model techniques. So DEC2 um, uses exactly the same normalization that I, uh, that I walked through for you guys, but instead of those discrete probability models that DEC used, um, now it uses the negative binomial within the generalized linear model context. Edge R also uses a negative binomial generalized linear model. Lima and Voom use a normal linear model. Many of you might be familiar with uh, Lima as a microarray uh, differential expression technique. It's actually really flexible, um, and they've extended it with the Voom is the, is the RNA-seq extension to the Lima package, which was differential expression on microarrays. Poisson-seq also uses a generalized linear model, but with a Poisson um, uh, probability model underlying it. All right, two more. We're getting there. Might even make my time, even though I started a few minutes late. Okay, so um, so <clears throat> another way to think about this is to think about um, non-parametrics. So not thinking about probability models, right? Finding probabilities through counting and through ranking rather than by assuming that the data, the generative um, data distribution is, follows something like a negative binomial. So this is the Wilcoxon rank sum test, and what it does is it says, are the biggest values in condition A or condition B, or are the values sort of spread throughout condition A and condition B? And I just made up some numbers, and you can see that the smallest value is in condition A, and the biggest value is in condition A, so the first and the sixth, and the third, condition, the third biggest is in condition A, whereas the second, fourth, and fifth are in condition B. This is just standard Wilcoxon rank sum test. Um, and my test statistic will always just be, just be the sum of the ranks in condition A. That's because... Um, uh, condition B is the leftovers. Like it's always going to add to the same thing. It's going to add one to n, always adds to the same number, and so you only need to worry about one side of it. And so we say how big is negative 0.5? It seemed in this particular case that I made up, um, negative 0.5 is not a big test statistic, so we would say that there's no evidence for these genes to be differentially expressed. Um, so uh, we would just go from there. Now, the problem here is that um, we have size factor issues. Right, because you would never just compare these numbers and rank them apples to apples because they're not apples to apples unless we deal with the size factors. So Lee and Tibshirani came up with SAMSEQ, which is a way of doing a Wilcoxon rank sum test, but with a sampling mechanism. It's actually a Poisson sampling scheme, but the p-values are through the ranking mechanism. So the p-values are not done through a Poisson model, um, but the sampling scheme is. Um, and, and they sample in such a way that the sizes for all of the genes are, the, they sample in a statistical way such that the biological samples 
have the same size factor. And then they can apply the Wilcox and rank, rank sum test. They do it multiple times to average out variability. Um, and the p-value is then based on, on the ranks and not on a parametric distribution. One more. Um, some of you may have heard of these methods, BaseSeq and EBSeq. Um, and so uh, these methods use empirical Bayes information to, um, to uh, bolster the power of the tests. Um, both also use negative binomial probability distributions to come up with what's called a posterior probability of differential expression. So um, when, we, when we do any kind of inference in a Bayesian setting, we're looking for posterior probabilities instead of p-values. So um, there's a lot of similarities in what comes of this, um, but it's a slightly different language. Um, and my parentheses seem to be off. Uh, and that is all I have to say about that. Thank you.